I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Lars Carlson for those who believe he needs introduction. Uh, Lars is uh, president of KGH Border Services, uh, an international customs capacity building company. He's spent 30 years as a customs leader, specifically involved in reform and modernization. Lars was the first director of capacity building of the World Customs Organization from 2006 to 2010, where he spearheaded the work of developing capacity building strategies, standards, infrastructure, and operational programs, including Columbus and Picard. Before joining the WCO, he held key positions within Swedish customs, including as acting deputy director general, uh, director customs, and head of ICT reform and modernization. Lars has extensive work experience in many countries. In 2010, he was appointed as an honorary fellow of the International Network of Customs Universities, and he is currently the only honorary fellow of INCU. In recognition of his distinguished contribution to the WCO's Picard program, to the INCU, and to promoting the academic standing of the customs profession, please uh, join me in welcoming Lars Carlson. Thank you very much, Chairperson, for that very kind introduction. Colleagues and friends, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a great uh, pleasure and an honor for me to be here today addressing you uh, on the topic of leadership and the role of leadership in capacity building reform and modernization. And I will do so under the title, When Elephants Fly, uh, Leadership and Management in the Age of Globalization. Uh, and I will talk about uh, capacity building uh, in a leadership perspective. But before doing that, uh, I also need to say this is a year of celebration for me because I celebrate uh, 30 years in customs and as a customs officer. And there's no better way to do that than actually being here on the first INCU Global Conference. And I would like to congratulate David Widdison and the INCU for, for setting this up. But also, I would like, of course, to join all of those who have thanked Chairman Aydin Aliyev uh, and his team uh, for the wonderful conference, the wonderful arrangement, the wonderful hospitality. Every time I go to Baku, uh, I get astonished uh, about the outstanding hospitality and friendship of the Aseri people. So thank you very much. Moving on to the topic of leadership. I think that leadership has always intrigued mankind and uh, I have no intention of trying to explain to you uh, other things around leadership that you don't already know, but I will try to put it into a perspective that I think is relevant for this conference and for us as customs uh, managers, customs people, private sector, academia in the world of world trade. For me, leadership is about vision. And as Warren Benny said, leadership is the capacity to translate vision into reality. This is something I really believe in. And I think that we have great challenges ahead. This will be more important than ever. And I think as an example, I think this is exactly, exactly what President John F. Kennedy did uh, on May 25, 1961, when he addressed the Congress with these words. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Putting a man on the moon before the decade is over and returning him safely to earth. That's one of the biggest visions we could ever have. And of course, we all know the story. We know that on July 20th, 1969, before the decade was over, a man really was walking on the moon, and we heard those That's one words. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And of course, this is a big dream, but it's also a token on a vision and a leadership to actually accomplish what you set out to accomplish. And these heroes that did that specific journey, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins, of course, you can only imagine what they thought, what they were thinking about when they were returning to Earth and when they actually landed on Earth. And you know what the first thing that happened to them when they landed was, of course, customs contacted them and said, do you have anything to declare? 
And of course, this also shows uh, how this is interlinked. Of course, there's the original customs declaration from U.S. Customs at the time. We wanted to know, as customs officers, do you have any moon rocks, aliens, whatever, that you bring in? Because that is also heroism. There's also heroes that is fighting another frontier. If in the 60s, the space was the frontier that we would conquer, I fully believe and I fully agree with Dr. Bernstein who said, today, the cyberspace is the new frontier that we need to conquer. To be able and, and use the information space, the, the possibilities that are there uh, for us, as was described this morning in a very brilliant presentation, I think. This is the new challenge we have. And we need leadership to be able to do that, and we need to do it fast. Another example, of course, we have experienced these last days when being in Azerbaijan is the father of the Republic of Azerbaijan, Haidar Aliyev was a leader who looked into institutional capacity building as a foundation for forming a new nation. And I think that's very, very important from all leaders on all levels to look at that. And as Chairman Aliyev was stated the other day when we opened, uh, Haidar Aliyev had visions around also institutions like customs already in the beginning of forming the nation. A third example, long away from these political leaders, is Lawrence Anthony. Lawrence Anthony is a very famous scientist that worked many, many years in Africa and in other parts of the world in saving uh, endangered species. He had a specific way of doing that. He got to learn to know the species. He learned to know the animals, because that was the only way he could save them. So he became leaders of several of these type of species, and one of them was the elephants. And there's a very well-documented story that when Lawrence Anthony became the leader of an elephant herd, when he passed away in 2012, these, this elephant herd walked for 20 hours and came to his house and stood grieving by his house for two days and then returned into the wilderness. And I think that any leader that has any ambition, this is the kind of legacy we all would like to have. So, of course, again, these examples also show us that it's not only about vision, it is also about trust, it's about having the ability, the uh, courage, the decision-making to be able and transform visions and dreams into reality. And I think we really have to do that in the customs environment, as this conference is an example on, and as we heard this morning, because we are really in front of a paradigm shift. We are in the middle of it, in fact. And of course, we have now had a decade of globalization. Fifteen years ago, we talked about globalization. We read about it in books. We didn't know what it was. Today, we know. The last decade, we've seen crises in the world that have global crisis that started as domestic crisis became global crisis. We had security crisis, as we heard about, that had main impact on what we are doing in 9-11, the tragic 9-11 events. We would had commodity crisis where interlinked markets have uh, created problems with pricing which have enormous impact on developing countries. We had, of course, the global financial crisis, again, starting as a domestic crisis, growing into a global crisis. And lately, we have seen in Europe, and we heard Sir Christopher Pizzoridis talk about the political, political crisis of Europe around the euro currency. These are normal things for us now. It wasn't 15 years ago. And of course, it has a major impact on what we do. This is one phase of globalization we now know. It has challenges. It has possibilities. There's another phase of globalization. I just mentioned it. This year, we will pass 3 billion airplane passengers during 2014. We are moving. We are not anymore stationary in our own countries. There are more people who have access to mobile phones than clean water. I don't know what it says about us, but it's a fact. And we use those mobile phones and smartphones to interlink to each other through social media through different types of different systems programs. There are more than one billion people in a network called Facebook that we didn't know about 10 years ago. These things create possibilities. And then, of course, I have to mention the most incredible of all these globalization effects, and that is a Korean rapper named Psy, 
who has done a video and a song, as you all have heard, called The Gangnam Style. And I'm not going to do the dance, I promise. I'm not going to do that. I could, but I won't. But the interesting thing with that specific video, rap video, is that it has been clicked on two billion times on YouTube and the Internet. Two billion times. And it's increasing every day. So that says something about the possibilities of data, the possibilities of internet, the possibilities of cyberspace, and all the things that also, again, Dr. Bersin talked about this morning, and the possibility to apply that into a customs environment. Trade is increasing. We heard about the South-South trade increase, uh, the, the big changes that is happening around the world. Uh, we've seen the pictures during this conference. And of course, this has an impact on customs, for sure. There's a saying in some parts of Africa that change will come when elephants fly. Like in other parts of the world, we say when pigs fly. This is very true, but it's also true that the elephants are flying already. Sorry about that. Because the world is changing very rapidly. We can read about it on media every day. We can read about the, the changed world also when it comes to infrastructure, when it comes to trade, when it comes to economy and when it comes to trade interlink, uh, trade with different countries. Of course, today, these are the elephants that are flying already. And there will be more and there will be others in the future. And this is a possibility, not only a challenge. So what's the response by customs? Well, the response by customs is a number of global concepts. It's harmonization, standardization. We need standardized models, we need new models, we need new principles. And some of them we already have. We are talking risk management during these days. We are talking single windows. We are talking one-stop shop, authorized economic operators and MRA, my favorite topic in the world. And these concepts are known, but they are now being implemented. And of course, the Trade Facilitation Agreement has an effort of being an instrument to support that implementation. So this is a response, but we will need others as well. And of course, we will need strong leadership to be able to do this uh, on the ground. So why, why write a book? That's a good question, I'm, i, I got to admit, because everyone who is flying knows that there's, there's tons of books about leadership. If you go through an airport store, you will see that some of these 10,000 management books that are written every year is there. So uh, a lot of the things are already invented here. But we do know about capacity building specifically for customs. We worked on capacity building, as Dr. Los Banco said, now for 15 years. We know how it works. We know what works and doesn't work. And this is my definition on capacity building. Capacity building is to build sustainable capacity to manage change over time. It's not to implement a specific program or an IT system. It's not about only education or training. These are parts of capacity building, but it's bigger. It's about being able to respond to the challenges in the world around us. And of course, we also know that leadership is the fundamental, single most important factor to succeed in capacity building. And we have seen this over the years. We now have worked with diagnostics. Based on 400 diagnostics around the world in more than 120 countries, and I have read all those diagnostic reports, even Mr. Hall's, um, and we know that leadership is fundamental. That is what makes the difference if we are able to do these things we need to do on implementation. So of course we need to start looking at how can we fundamentally implement a culture of leadership development structured in our capacity building programs in our organizations. We heard a good example from Qatar recently. I was just there last week in Doha. Very good example on how education, leadership education, training, bigger things, building, is there. You see it in many countries, but we need to do more, we need to do better. So what I did was I surveyed uh, around 100 uh, customs director generals uh, about their views on leadership in specifically customs, uh, and also, of course, what they thought about the free future. I have also uh, interviewed or really surveyed 300 management students uh, that is now going to be the future uh, leaders uh, of our world and uh, to listen to what is their view and their expectations of the future. And I have deep interviewed 15 custom leaders I've learned to know personally in my career, 20-year career as a customs uh, leader. 
and of course among them the finance minister of South Africa, Pravin Gordon, and the former commissioner of US CBP, Rob Bonner, but also some people in this room that's been very important to me, like again my mentor, Dr. Lospenko, and my other mentor, Professor West, so I think is down there, Sitsovsky and uh, several others, and of course, I have also interviewed a very visionary leader we have in this room, that's Chairman Aydin Aliyev. As been stated many times during this conference, uh, the accomplishment he has done with Azerbaijan State Customs Committee is commendable, it's remarkable, and it's something we really need to, uh, to look into and learn more from. So based on that, and also some other uh, issues. I've been trying to get hold also of political leaders and also to listen and look to some of the inspirational leaders I have had uh, the honor to follow uh, on a distance on how they looked at customs modernization, government modernization, and, uh, and uh, capacity building, and try to put that down as well and, and get it into a format where we can use it as a handbook and as a training material for the future. All the statistical material we got together, I've helped, have helped by the famous Professor Hans Rosling, Sweden, uh, who is a well-known statistician who have now worked together with us to try to get this together. So, finally, just to summarize this, it's very important to point out that leadership is not a gift. It's a talent, yes, but it's something you practice. It's exactly what Malcolm Gladwell wrote in his book about outliers, the 10,000 hours we talk about. We need to be able and grow new leaders, mid-managers, top leaders from actually practicing in leadership, giving them opportunities in project management, giving them prop, uh, proper prop, uh, uh, opportunities in, in leading and taking responsibility. That's how we grow the next generation of leaders. And there are some key words in there that comes out from all of these interviews, and I won't go through them because they're generic. But what is then different with customs? Well, what is different with customs from other management areas is the environment we work in. Because we do work, as was said this morning, in the center of international trade, in the center of a very complicated area, which also has and holds the keys to the development of our world. So the environment by itself is specific. So it's important to learn from those who have been there and who is going into that type of roles and how we can transfer that knowledge into others. So I've also then developed a, a six-step uh, capacity building program uh, around leadership capacity where it's uh, about generic but also specific customs related uh, specific capacity building on leadership. These are things I think, we need, I think we need to build into our capacity building modernization programs. So, to summarize, we need to climb to the top, we need to be better. And of course, we can always improve, and we'll need and we'll have to do that. And I think we can do that in the future. I think we can take the leadership that was asked for by Dr. Bersin this morning, and that was talked about by, by the other speakers and Dr. Lusbenko as well. I think it's possible that we can do that. And I hope that we will be able to put in place that new paradigm, those new uh, in, in, inspirational infrastructure that was talked about this morning. And if we do, and if we do then manage to implement the trade facilitation agreement, the authorized economic program, uh, operator program, the single windows that we have been talking about these days, all the elements of the trade facilitation agreement, I hope next time we go to space, and it doesn't matter if it's going to be an American uh, space crew, or a Russian one, an Indian one, a Chinese one, even maybe a Swedish one, I don't know. If we go to space, when we go to space, when we go to the next planet, when we come back, could we please not have a paper declaration for customs? It would be great if we could have a very smart space phone that was secure, that we could send one single declaration into Earth, and it would go into all agencies all around the world. And I think this is really the question to be asked. Are elephants flying? If they are, what does it mean to us? And this is what I've been trying to, to answer in this book. And I think this afternoon when you go out walking in the beautiful Baku, and I hope you do because it's worth seeing, just watch out a little bit because otherwise this might happen.
if you want to know more about this, you get a flyer on your desk. Uh, it's possible to get a copy of this book, of course, but you can also contact me on all those social media you see up there, lastcarlson.com, capacity now on Twitter, uh, and this possibility to do those exchanges that we need to do. Uh, and I really hope that we can work together on these uh, different things that we've talked about this morning because I think it's extremely important. The moment is here, change is here, and I thank you very much for your attention. Well, visionary, inspiring, Lars is a, a true leader, and uh, there is nobody better qualified, I think, to tell us about leadership than Lars, whether it's in relation to customs uh, or otherwise. He has a talent, and he's been practicing it, practicing it for many, many years. And I really would recommend that uh, I'll certainly be sending that off, uh, Lars. I want my free copy, fully signed. Thank you very much.